How is it in London? What time is it there? Oh, what time is it in London? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, <laughs> eight hours behind. Yeah, I think it's probably 4 a.m. in the morning or something. Yeah. Good morning to everybody watching on the live stream and watching on the replay. We have a very special guest. And uh, I'm so excited, actually, about uh, the Chef Philip John mm -hmm. Golding. Uh, I, I met him long time ago. I think the first time was in Yats in Clark. And uh, but I never really knew the whole story. I'm sure he has a lot. He's actually probably one of the most, the longest. No? <laughs> the I could remember Chef when I was starting in our awesome planet. Uh, he he was already there um, in the scene, and we'll be talking to Chef Philip John Golding about. His story about his culinary DNA, how he started, and uh, guys, please share this video. Um, this will be a very inspiring story, and um, you know, it's an ongoing uh, uh, development on how he continues to be relevant throughout the years. It's just so amazing. So I can't wait to um, to know more about her, uh, his story. Um, my name is uh, Anton Diaz, founder of Our Awesome Planet, together with the Adobo Queen uh, streaming live, uh, Nancy Reyes Lumen streaming with, live, yeah, and with our 24 carat Mr. Golding. Miss, uh, good, good morning, morning. <laughs> good morning, Anton. Uh, good morning, and uh, we're awesome live with Chef Philip. Sorry for the, <laughs> the election noise. Uh, can you do a short, please? Short, Let's get this started. Uh, yes. So, Chef, uh, maybe we could start off with how did you get started um, here in the Philippines or your culinary career in uh, in London? Before no, uh, let, let, Philip, yeah, how, old so, were you, how old were you when you first landed in the Philippines? 26. 26. Oh, okay. And, and I, I came on holiday, first of all, and then I met Billy King, right? So the legendary Le Souffle. And um, I had a great time with Billy and I, I just came on holiday and Billy said, uh, you know, if ever you want to come over this side of the world, uh, you know, to, to, to look into working here, um, why don't you, you know, think about it, consider it. And uh, then I ended up uh, coming over and working with him at, at Paper Moon then, the Italian restaurant in Jupiter Street. So that was fun. And working with Billy was awesome. Yeah, Billy's of Irish descent. Yeah, so... After that, uh, you know, that was a five-year stint with um, Paper Moon and some activities there. And at that time, um, I'd also applied at CCA to, um, to to help out and to see where I could work with mm -hmm. CCA during that time. So that became also uh, a fantastic journey until uh, today, you know, currently with CCA. So I always wanted, because in London, I had been running... A, which attempts Conrad. I've been running a cooking school called Butler's Wolf Chef School, and I'd had my own restaurant called Azuro. Uh, actually, Tuto, sorry, Tuto. Azuro came in the Philippines, but it was uh, Tuto. Yeah, so Tuto was the restaurant. We had Chiswick, Sunningdale. Uh, we had three different restaurants out there, but I was uh, sworn by the, um, the, the, the beaches and, and Filipino hospitality, and I could see amazing potential in the country and in the people, and that was 26 years ago. Okay. Wow. So how did you get started in London? Maybe uh, before we continue, uh, how, how young did you get into culinary uh, and then well, before okay. coming to the food? So that's a great question. So basically, both my parents were very, very hardworking. One was a florist. Uh, she was a top florist in, in the UK, in London. And then my father was a central heating engineer, a plumber. So, you know, they were never really at home. And uh, I had a young brother. And I kind of fell into cooking at home, having to kind of just at the beginning, you know, put, try to help to put bread on the table by cooking. Um, and of course, experimental, very experimental at that stage. So, so um, also at the weekend, you know, we kind of, I wanted a bit of pocket money. So I, I enlisted in a pub to do washing up, right? Where a lot of chefs started is from the sinks, right? So... Um, it was very funny because I ended up working at a local pub uh, in a beautiful countryside. 
And uh, after about three months, the chef ran away with the waitress. And <laughs> the, owner <laughs> said me, the owner said to me, you've been here long enough. How about you do something? So, of course, my first days of blending soups and the lids coming off and then splattering the whole kitchen with soup and myself. And, you know, it was a trial and error. And um, it was fun. And when I look back at those days, they were very, you know, of course, naive and fun. And, and, and it was cool. So that's how I started to get in the kitchens and then work my way up to um, schooling. And I went to professional college in uh, London and then in, in a place called Slough. Um, and then I got a scholarship. I was very lucky with the scholarship that uh, I competed in to get a place. And then it sent me to France, Italy, and that pretty much, you know, um, grew me up very fast in the in the in the hospitality industry you know one thing i can say about chef philip having known you for maybe almost the same time right even azuro even before azuro he never rests this guy does not sleep every time i see him he's into something and he's always excited about what he's doing he's moving yeah. he's, he was into salmon yeah. and everything you know I think we met before when you were selling an appliance and I was also selling another appliance at the Magnolia in New Manila or something. That's the last time I saw you. I, said, yeah. I remember. Yeah. I remember. I remember. Yes, yes. <laughs> Actually, yeah. that's fun because as, as a chef, as a chef, especially in the Philippines, you know, in terms of pots, pans, uniforms, whatever it may be, I've always looked at the retail angle. You know, I can't rest when it comes to finding the nicest jackets or the nicest knives or whatever. And I share that with my students, right? So I, I, I kind of have been pushed to do things that I would never have done in my home country, right? And I consider uh -huh. this is also as a home country being here half my life already, actually more so. Um, but ge generally anything that to do with hospitality, wines, uh, anything, a uh, supply chain, which I've stepped into. Um, yeah, it's a full circle. And I've been lucky in the Philippines to get those opportunities and that wet network, which I probably would never have done in London, right? Because once you're in a job, you're really locked and bolted down, so to speak. The freedom is kind of limited, um, say, being abroad. But being here, there's so much opportunity and continues to grow the opportunities. Okay. Uh, I actually have a lot of questions for you. Um, and uh, But maybe, you know, because you have uh, experience with CCA, the culinary, before that, uh, maybe you can comment on the culinary scene because you've seen Manila when it was really starting um, way back. Uh, you were already there, you know, doing all these restaurants with Billy King. Um, and yeah. then you've seen it when, you know, the, there were, the restaurants were booming. You've seen it during the pandemic and now. So maybe what's your comment about the culinary scene? Vis-a-vis -vis also international scene, uh, Filipino cuisine, what, what, what happened Yeah, throughout okay. your, in your point of view? Okay, so when you start from the streets of Jupiter, right? So you start with freestanding restaurants and then you're really a, a competing against hotel restaurants, right? Uh, they have bigger budgets, they have stronger networking teams. So in the earlier days, it was really restaurant, hotel, hotel, restaurant, you know, that was the competition. And then the malls came up, right? So Glorietta uh, and then restaurants started to, when Stars of San Francisco opened, you know, it was, wow, you know, Jeremiah Towers. So all of a sudden the big names come in and you were like a small homegrown restaurant name, right? Maybe it was foreign, maybe it was local. But you could see during that time, it was it was very simple because it was very regional in terms of whether you'd be a Malate with Colin Mackay, or whether it would be uh, Humphrey Navarro doing his thing. You know, during that time, it was such a small world. We were very, very small. And there was a few names on the table that were competing. And of course, Norbert and his team of, of young chefs, as we know, Antonio's, you know, these guys were still at the Mandarin Oriental, right? <laughs> so again, you know, it's a very, very close, tight knit and, and everyone was watching everybody. Then the malls came and chain restaurants came. So all of a sudden, there's an explosion of these malls, and different restaurants. And I think most people like gravitated towards the aircon, right? And going into the malls and buying <laughs> things and then eating there because purchasing first, whether it be bags, shoes, clothing, and then where are we going to eat? So again, it kind of diversified from there. And you're seeing that come back here now. You're seeing that since COVID that the, uh, obviously the malls have struggled uh, terribly to, to bring in markets right so you started to see open air and 
from Tagatai down to Pampanga, wherever, yeah. you started to see that we're embracing now the American and almost European culture of dining out fresco, right? Which before it's my net, it's too hot, it's da 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 da. And now you've got this different kind of mindset about dining out, which is actually fabulous. Yeah. Well, but anyway, before when you were still in London, it was was that a roast beef and potatoes thing? <laughs> I mean, so I'm classically you know, they, French trained. They, they <laughs> always tease uh, English food with English. that, you know. Well, that's and, a French and doing then, that. Yeah, and then here you go in uh, to, to Asia when it's a uh, bursting with so many flavors. Do you yeah, miss what's the, your DNA? Yeah, what's your DNA yeah, now? What's the yeah? What's the scene now in in your home motherland? Okay, so I was very, very lucky, right? So growing up, you know, I kind of looked Italian, so people thought I was Italian and not English, right? And I was very dark. <laughs> yeah. So I'm like, I kind of gravitated and said, Philip's Italian. No, I'm not. I'm really British. I'm English. All the way through. We just, I got, <laughs> you know, this is how I look, right? But I was always kind of considered as, as someone who was Hispanic or Mexican or whatever. It's just how I was born, right? So, of course, in England, you know, opening up Italian restaurants, I kind of didn't speak Italian, but I kind of looked foreign. So, you know, it kind of worked for me. And, um, you know, uh, Italian cuisine and, and in London, uh, we love Indian food, right? So we, we I grew up with Indian food and I love spices. So Ooh. it's one of the countries where it's kind of interesting because of the Commonwealth and how the, U, the English went around the world and stuck their flag everywhere, right? 140 odd Commonwealths. And um, I guess that England is, and especially the school that I ran there was a trading spice uh, area. And I was very, very lucky because there were really cool concepts, but Asian, apart from the Chinese restaurant, the Indian restaurant, there wasn't a lot. When you, had, when you saw a Thai restaurant open, it was like, wow, got to go there, got to try it. So now, I mean, obviously people, I, I work with Heston, I've worked with Gordon. So, you know, now what you're starting to see is that those chefs, um, are now really looking to Southeast Asia. And you can see in their concepts now, they're really tweaking their menus, their food. And um, uh, you can see these chefs really coming over here and learning and trying to learn and then going back. And um, you can see, I judge a lot of UK competitions uh, online. I did, I was invited to judge last year. And you can see that from the vanilla bean uh, panna cotta or creme brulee, it's now pandan. You see a lot of Asian yeah. flair in the schools now and you see a lot of course my country has, has, has changed so much in terms of um, diversity uh, and demographics in, in in our culture we are a really integrated country now london is uh, is a, a multicultured uh, culture so therefore flavors and, and food and religions i mean we've really changed in the last i'd say 30 years as well mm -hmm. yeah. yeah and what um yeah. Yeah. go nancy yeah. again uh, who who influenced you in your cooking when you were a kid? Your mom, your dad? Good question. Good question. Who really? I, I guess my mom was 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 a decent cook, right? She was very good. What when she could in the kitchen, she did amazing cauliflower cheese and as you said, roast beef and horseradish sauce and Yorkshire puddings and stuff like yeah. that. But she was really into it. My dad influenced me my, by taking me out. He would take me, we're fortunate that he could take me to different restaurants to try. And he was a big foodie and he was a big wine guy and, and then sparkling mm. wines and champagne. So he was really into the lifestyle. So I was fortunate that I, you know, was, was able to experience um, different restaurants, different cuisines and, um, yeah, mum mum was, was when she could on a Sunday that was traditional and then our grandparents and then going down. My grandmother lived in by the beach, by the coast, where my dad has just moved now. And we had an allotment, which I love because I just did something with urban uh, farmers in BGC. And that's where you own your allotment and you grow your beetroots, your onions, you grow your vegetables, and that's what you bring to the table. And that's that's fun. We I start to see that culture really happening here a lot the the seed to table the farm to table but in england i grew up with that so i grew up with preserved and pickles and other items that um you would grow up in the household but that was in the grandmothers and then we lost that because of commercialism and supermarkets which kind of took away the the street vendors and it became commercialized much similar to to the philippines as well became, yeah they're mechanized, mechanized by the malls and took away the artisan boutique places and the butcher shop the local butcher shop which was amazing yeah. 
Yeah. Um, that's coming here now. I really see that happening yeah. here. I see that. Yes. Yeah. Where Where do you get your uh, British food fix in Manila, or is there any uh, place for good? Yeah, there British is. There food? is. Uh, normally, I do it myself. I do it at home. <laughs> I don't get a lot of time to. <laughs> but you know, in in, in Clark in Pabango, when I open the arts, I open up a London pub. I build a London pub, and I had some partners in there, and the kitchen would be provided by Yats Kitchen during that time. So we would do, you know, the typical fish and chips, and then we would do a chicken tikka or a tandoor, a curry, pilaf, and stuff like that. So, you know, the good thing about the UK is that you know, people roast beef. Our number one dish is chicken, you know, it's chicken tikka or something, or chicken masala or yeah. whatever. So, Indian. yeah, so, yeah, so Indian, we have a very, very strong uh, Asian Indian um, culture. And, uh, you know, I like to be around in, in here when I say London, I say London food would be, we have some very good Indian restaurants opened up here in the last uh, five years. And, uh, I work with them um, with uh, part time with the, the rich group. I'm helping them. They're putting up in Barakai. They're putting up in uh, Angeles. They've just done. And I like working and doing. You know, uh, when I'm not at CCA, I like continuing to grow my own uh, recipe database. Okay. What's the name of that restaurant you're working on in Barakai? Uh, well, so I, I I kind of been helping out uh, the Royal Indian Curry House, right? There's some great restaurants out there. There's Indus, there's a okay. Ranjit at Mantra, but Rich, the Royal Indian Group, are a, a great group of um, of uh, um, foodies, and they're opening up. But they've got Moa, they've got Makati, um, they've just opened in Angeles. And ah, um, nice. now it next is Subic and then uh, Baraka. They're opening Baraka. So it's amazing nice. how the Philippines now has really opened up to Indian cuisine as well. And it's very flavorful and it's very good for you in terms of the spices, the ingredients. And um, yeah, that's that's interesting. Yeah. And I'm putting up, I'm, I'm launching I Love Curry uh, on Food oh, Panda nice. next month as well, which is nice. a little fun. Nice. Pro These are fun projects to inspire students. <laughs> and uh Yats is still open or yeah Yats is still there but Phil Invest took the whole area so oh. you know a, a, Phil Invest is developing it so I guess all the little small places there now I mean Yats was incredible I mean that's 30,000 bottles three million dollars in wine and that was when I was in got not burnt out but it came to a point in my life in, in, in Manila where so much was going on it was difficult to keep up myself so I said, Pampanga, Pampanga might be a great place instead of, instead of going somewhere else. And, you know, it, it's so competitive in Manila during those those days. Very competitive. Yeah. Restaurants would last less than six months to a year to two years. And people would go try it, make an opinion and move on somewhere else. And move on. So you have to keep always spinning that wheel like a hamster. So I thought, hold on, Pampanga's pretty cool. I like Pampanga. You know, people are kind of a bit more laid back. Food is interesting. You know, food culture. And then, of course, the wine cellar and my dear friend Chris Locker during that time, God bless his soul, yeah. passed away just before COVID. But Chris was an inspiring chef. So I didn't necessarily go out to Pampanga. I sent someone out as a spinner to go and kind of <laughs> dig the roots, lay the seed. I was a bit, okay, let's see what Pampanga's all about. And then it was amazing to see um, what Chef Chris did, who was the original chef at Yacht. He was amazing, amazing chef, amazing yeah, person. Was amazing. Uh, yeah. So dedicated. And Mr. Panitza, right? And uh, out in Pampanga, people just drive in the droves to go to Yaks. And I was very fortunate that um, after that, I decided that I would like to spend some time in uh, Pampanga. And it really, it was an inspiring place. And obviously, I still believe Clark, Subic, and, and moving down to that area has so much potential. Um, and we had yeah. a great wine cellar. So. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think of some Philippine liqueurs? I don't think we have wine. But, uh, you know... Well, in Houston, sorry, there's a very the uh, what's this about pa, Lolo, Papa John or some what's that that uh, tequila or Don Papa Don, Don Papa. Papa is so popular here. Yeah, the rum, the rum, yeah, the, the, rum, rum. the rum, yeah, yeah. But that's very funny because yesterday I was talking to Doctor Luna uh, at CCA uh, oh. in the Mancom, and we were discussing uh, Philippine spirits, right, like the mango liqueurs, yeah. like the Lambanog, because we have Lacan, Lacan. Uh, it is amazing, but it's it, it's kind of your tequila, right? And it's very interesting, right? Yeah. So it is interesting. And we were talking about reviving um, local spirits. And, you know, you have Kalel, who's out there in the uh, yeah. 
Buddhist temples out there in Bhutan at the moment, right? Yeah. And I believe, but it take, it's going to take a little bit more time, is that I said one idea is to look at local spirits and infuse them like I've done. I've worked with Breville for now 11 years and they've supported and I'm support. We have a very good team in Breville. So with the coffee machines, we coffee and iced coffee. And of course, in, 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 in the UK, Irish coffees are so popular. Yeah. yeah, I grew up with Irish coffees. So that could be the next trend. And since you saw Ube, that beautiful, delicious version of Bailey's, right? But it's an mm -hmm. Ube liqueur, liqueur by the wow. Adimac group. Wow, it's delicious, right? And now I have a creme so brulee that waves to it. So that, it's getting there. It's getting there. But again, it's always about the labeling. Don Papa, believe it or not, the label was done in Hong Kong. The spirit obviously is from here, but the uh -huh. packaging of Don Papa itself yeah. is, is tremendous and done by a UK company in Hong Kong. Oh, ah. <laughs> okay. that's good. Nice. Yeah, it, well, it's a hit here. Very, very good. Good. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So um, while we're talking about Filipino food, uh, what, what, what's your take on Filipino food um, progression throughout the years? Uh, and, you know, uh, to your point of view, uh, is Filipino food arrived already in the global scene? What what do we still need to do to uh, make it happen? Okay, so every cuisine starts with produce. So 70% of what we do is to find the farmer, the fisherman, the supply chain. And as we know, we're challenged with the supply chain at the best of times and was agriculture a sexy job for farmers to get into? I mean, now yeah. we start to see traceability, sustainability, all these buzzwords in education in, in, in the world, right? So in terms of the essence of regional cuisine, and I was involved recently with TESDA, I was involved with CCA, we're coming up with a cookbook, we're working together with, with our faculty, that with my students in 2021, 2022, and they're very inspiring, and they're very passionate about their regions. So we're starting to see a, a great breakthrough, but it's hand in hand, the fishermen, uh, the vegetables, right? The fruits, and then go back to history, go back to your grandmother, your great grandmother. There's yeah. a lot of heirloom recipes there <laughs> that are locked away and it's the time to yeah. discover them and don't shortcut the process or the technique, right? Try to, it's great to have nouveau Philippine cuisine. I was inspired at Josh Boltwood's uh, in, the other week to try um, his new menu and it's so Filipino so inspiring and cleverly and, and well thought put together very inspiring um, but on the traditional side of Filipino cuisine um, hopefully um, the, the generations there's sometimes a little bit of a gap with transferring those recipes and the knowledge is that maybe the Philippines is now trying to rediscover the originality of these recipes and I was very fortunate to sit with Doreen Fernandez when I was here uh, in the beginning and she was such an inspiring lady and uh, again taken from us too soon uh, but Doreen was really a, just an incredible lady when it came to Philippine culture, history and uh, there's a, a lady called Felicity, Felicine uh, Felicity who's here Felicia oh my lord what what an amazing woman as yeah. well she sits on an advisory board and it's oh, just the stories yeah. are incredible the stories are incredible so again yes it, it's it's amazing to see that philippine cuisine uh is is getting attention and and right and rightly so but i guess it's a constant journey um and you know again understanding where those dishes come from okay. any favorite uh filipino food Adobo. I'm a huge fan of tinola, right? I love Ooh. tinola and I love peanut, peanut bed, right? So I love that. And a few years ago, I went to Mexico to represent the Philippines. And uh, the dish that I chose was tinola because of its medical, you know, the, the broth that we made, the ginger, the salabat for the throat, malungai for diabetes. So I'm very yeah. much into food is thy medicine, right? And um, I believe that through food and, and refining Philippine cuisine, taking out potentially too much white sugar, taking out the nitrates, producing a dish that's Filipino, but using the philosophy of how could this benefit the body? How can we nourish our body? That's nah. good. So Team Tinola. Yeah. Uh, team Adobo. I love Adobo, Nancy. I love Adobo. I love you too. <laughs> 
<laughs> the adobo queen. <laughs> now, um, before we go to the photos, um, we have to talk about CCA. Uh, the yes, CCA has been probably the, you know, when CCA was the there, was that the only culinary school in uh, Manila at the time? And Correct. what happened yeah. thr throughout uh, until today? Uh, and how did CCA, you know, progress also throughout these years? Okay, so CCA was was uh, extremely successful when it opened, right? When it first opened, it was the school, and it's just amazing to look at those students and where they are for now. And on Friday, I'm attending a dinner with John Panabatura, who was a student who's now um, the executive chef in uh, Abu Dhabi of the Hilton Group. It's just amazing the journey of, say, 20, it's now 25 years, right, that CCA has been around how it inspired yeah. the Philippine industry to professionalize it, right? It was the first, it was the pioneering school. And, you know, you look at the Rob Pengsons and all the people that went through and taught in that school. And, it, you know, the Pauline Lagdameos who yeah, so much, you know, James Antolin. So, you know, if you'll find that someone out there went through CCA to teach Oji Rela, who I brought in to do Malaysian cuisine, Oji, God rest his soul again, you know, Oji was an incredible instructor, right? And brought, but the DNA of the Decathlon program, the programs are solid. FBCAC, Fundamentals of Baking and Culinary Arts, the Diploma in Culinary Arts and Technology Management. CCA from day one invested in the program. Along that way, the programs have been built on. We now have 18 programs and uh, our digital online program, uh, if it wasn't for say, unfortunately, COVID, we were already looking at our 2020 vision three years ago, but it, it was accelerated and we partnered with Ruby, which is um, an amazing platform with 650,000 users. And I myself was like, can we teach online? Can we actually do that? You know, that was just even before COVID. I was involved with Costings, Calc Menu, all these other software um, companies to look at how we could, if you're in a kitchen in London, how could you do teaching or food in Manila or Singapore? Yeah. So, I mean, we've always looked at technology, but it was COVID that accelerated everything and stuck us. And for the first time, it's like, oh my goodness, I can't leave my apartment. I can't. How? And then, of course, the school. We're very, very fortunate that through the management and through um, a lot of hard work that, that CCA could survive the, the, the COVID, right? But if that, you've got to go down to Mamani, Baji, uh, Bayer, so that's three generations I've worked with, and Dr. Yeah. Luna, who's a, a massive anchor. And then the faculty who are incredible and who are students, a number of them during 2000, during the first days of, of CCA, who had the DNA and the loyalty to the brand and the philosophy to support. And so we're opening BGC this year. I'm very excited to announce. We've opened in Antipolo uh, three months ago. Um, we've moved out of uh, QC at the moment to uh, also Maganhawa. Uh, thanks to Chef Wire, we've taken over her place while she's in um, Baguio. So Baguio. she's uh, given us the pastry kitchen. And now we're looking to take the school more regional and partner up. We have Holy Angel, we have UP Los Banos, we have UAP, University of Asia Pacific. So again, Dr. Luna, Mambaji, uh, Bayer, the whole team don't sleep either during <laughs> COVID. They work three times as hard, three times as hard. And, you know, the ability tech, you know, through, 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 um, uh, you know, through the internet is fabulous. If we didn't have the internet, oh my. I don't even want to think about it, but it was fabulous to migrate from hands-on. You know, of course, it's so sad to see students enroll and then they don't get to really, you know, you, you're working for a camera or you're grading them through this or that. I mean, it is challenging, but it's amazing how CCA, you know, um, uh, moved around and, and made sure as a team that we continue to, to give first-class education and training and we continue to grow and grow and grow and work with partners. So... I'm very yeah. happy so, to see this. So yeah. how do you differentiate? How do you differentiate? You know, you have a competitor uh, across Ateneo. You have yeah. a lot of these culinary schools that open now in Manila. It's very competitive space. Uh, how do you Correct. differentiate? And what do you think about the the incoming, you know, new students after pandemic? Is there any difference? Yeah. And may I add well, to that, Philip? How does, that, how does it go in the equation of finding jobs for these students? Yeah. Excellent, excellent questions, right? And during that, I, I partnered up with Grant Hyatt, with Mark Hagen, to create a mindset that 
when you go into your internship program, you already are going to be employed. So you're not, we're not putting you out there as a CCA graduate to do an internship. We're putting you out and ah. from day one that you enroll in the school, we already define your career path. I don't want to let too many cats out the back in this interview, but we're <laughs> working. You know, I was very lucky to be funded by the leasing family to do Escoffier, to do uh, things I did. And I'm very thankful yeah. to them. And they're the Holland America. They're a 60 year old company. So uh, Dino Leasing, Jacob, and that team uh, have always been and inspired me and be behind me to back the projects that I bring to them. And that's become 360 with us actually taking over the Howard facility in Antipolo to run CCA. We have some very, very exciting programs. But like when you go to culinary arts and you want to be a chef, why would I go through a program, but I'm going to go on a ship? It's very different to cook on a ship than to cook in a Western or a, a kitchen. So different kitchens, different mindsets, um, different agendas. So we're really trying very hard to say, okay, you'd like to go and work because your grandfather and your and your father worked on the shipping line. So let's do a course that's really focused. And that's what's on my table at the moment is to develop better cruise line programs yes, focused on that mindset. Yep. And that's so important, Nancy, to make sure yep. that the end product, our student, the student journey is in line with job placement. And that yep. is my next role, you know, everywhere from London to Helsinki. This weekend during dinners, I have guys flying in that want Filipino talent. So that talent has to be aligned with the concept. And that's where we are now. And I'm very, you know, the Philippines is the greatest place to recruit. But I'm not a huge fan, obviously, of, of sending people out in the droves. It's not like that. It's not farming people out. I'd rather keep a lot of talent here. We need to run our restaurants here. Um, but the, the reality is that 75% of our young Filipino cooks and students want to go and work abroad like me yeah. everyone says chef do you know what it's like to be an ofw hello hello <laughs> you know i left <laughs> london at 17 i worked in paris where they think that you can't cook because you're from the uk they test you and they test you and they test you i went to italy which i loved and then i came to the philippines and it didn't stop there because i am the german of the scopier i go to china i go to i worked in vietnam i go and i'm very very lucky but i want to bring young chefs with me and that's where we're at now let me go and send um uh, a young Filipino to go and work in Cambodia, to work in Vietnam, to understand the essence of the dishes, to bring those dishes back here in authenticity and not just from a cookbook or from a, a culinary school. It's great to have those fundamentals and basics and the attitude is so important. But to go in the place and learn like I did French cuisine from the French masters, from Paul Bacuse, you know, in 1992, when I worked in a three-star Michelin restaurant and then to work in other restaurants, but to have that discipline, to have that approach, to have that passion, and to be taught by the most amazing people in the world. Anton, before you show the photos, I have to say, since you mm. didn't know him that long, I knew him longer. Yeah. The way he talks now is exactly the way he's energized. The way he's really, yeah, 100, wow. 101 percent. Wow. He's like that. I, yeah. I love you for that, Philip. Yeah, no, I. I am really inspired with this uh, conversation. But uh, before we go to the photos, uh, can you talk about this coffee eh? before we go yeah. uh, and how, relation with CCA? <clears throat> okay, so coffee was so important to me because as a as a as a British chef, as a UK chef, people are so. What's your cuisine? Yorkshire pudding and roast beef. <laughs> what is English cuisine, right? And again, it goes back to our produce and our hand dive scallops and the ingredients and the farmers and the fishermen and the vegetable producers, right? And the butchers. So um, I started off. Uh, uh, sorry, I've lost my train of thought there. Uh, Escoffier. So Escoffier itself, um, Escoffier, when I worked at the Savoy, there was this picture of Escoffier stoves. And then I read his books and then I understand his philosophy. Escoffier mm -hmm. is the rock star. He is the, you know, we had the, almost the Bible of the kitchen for chefs to cook those dishes and follow those dishes. The croque monsieur, the croque madame, the poulet en all these dishes. I had to learn basic French, right? If I went to mm -hmm. France and learn and understand his idealism. He, for me, is an amazing mentor of, a, you know, he, 
He obviously passed away 100 years ago, 175 years ago. But he was so inspiring. He traveled all around. He created the Peach Melba. He created the duck press to make the duck and the jus. Yeah. So for me, it was like, I now have someone that I can relate to that had his foot in France and his foot in Italy. Um, if you read about Escoffier as any chef, right, or any young student, the fundamentals and what he did to transfer us as chefs and bring humidity and bring um, soup kitchen. He's just such an inspiration. And we, uh, uh, we pledge our allegiance to the, the, the vow of the transfer of knowledge. That's our word. So that's why we create dinners, create events, continually look at ways to work and do charity in any way and any capacity. So again, when I, uh, when Michel Lulier, the great grandson came to the Philippines and a guy called Robert Fontana, who's very inspiring in my career, who's now in Bali, and he's the chairman of uh, Asia. Uh, we were only seven delegations. And I said, I want the Philippines to be part of the growth of the delegation. So, uh, like Thailand and Cambodia, we were the youngest, um, and we had the youngest kind of uh, cooks in, in the industry, in, you know, in Southeast Asia. Uh, we're a young country. And, um, you know, it just went from there. And it was all about the competition and to get one Filipino to represent uh, the Philippines in Hong Kong or Seattle in Singapore and get the Philippine flag out there. And then Luis Mabolo was one of my huge successes back mm -hmm. in the day, Luis, you know, and now and she won best chocolate dessert because of Buddy Trinidad, because of the help of Buddy and a number of other chefs out there. Yeah. And she came and represented. And everyone said, she's too young, Philip. She's too young. What are you doing? Yeah. I said, I <laughs> see something in Louise. Louise, such an inspiration. And look at Louise today, right? Speaks for the yeah. UN. She's the Kokawa Project. I mean, if you don't start, if you don't push against all odds, you're never going to get really anywhere and with Escoffier it was like in the beginning oh, it was a lot of work and now I'm so happy to see that Escoffier is blooming it's doing very well we're not a big association but it really is something that I'm very um, proud of and then with the school with ICDE uh, the school is non-profit but ICDE is a business so I have to be careful because the association is non-profit and I work towards that and fully registered. And then ICD and CCA, I introduced the, the big boss of uh, Escoffier to CCA to produce the ICDE um, program. Who's the which big is boss? Institute Kuna. Robert Fontana, uh, Chairman Robert mm -hmm. Fontana. And he's like a godfather of Southeast Asia in terms of whenever a chef wants to go to Cambodia, China, wherever in Southeast Asia that we have a delegation, it's one phone call away. So if a young Filipino chef wants to go and work in any of those Southeast, there's eight delegations in China alone, then it's a phone call away from myself or Chef Sal, who's the president, and basically make a phone call to the chef and say, look, we have someone coming out there, can you take care of them? Can you help them? Yeah, and that's what it is, it's a network. We're 30,000 in the world and growing. And then we have La Dame, the Biscoffier, which is the female society membership, mm -hmm. which is very big in the US. Um, but Escoffier, I was very, very proud of the ICD program that we ran for six months. Uh, during COVID, obviously, it's on hold. We will um, restart that uh, in the very near future. But we're focused on some other programs that need attention at the moment. And then, um, yeah, the, the batches that we have that came out of there uh, were trained by French um, chefs. And it's, uh, it's like the SWAT of CCA. Um, it's an intense, tough but very uh, pro to French fundamentals. Nice. Galing, galing. All right, let's go to the photos. Um, just to um, share. Maybe ah. you can... That's my dad. That's my dad. <laughs> I, a big inspiration. Like and this... Sorry? He looks like me. <laughs> now I'm going to look like Toronto, right? So that's dad. You know, tough, tough couple of years for dad. He had uh, some kidney problems and... Uh, he, uh, you know, we're lucky to, to have him around, but he's just moved to the coast and um, an amazing, uh, an amazing person in my life and uh, love him dearly and see him at Christmas. To the right, my right here would be the little one there. That's uh, Liam. Liam is amazing. He's studying illegal management. He's there in Angeles. He's such wow. a foodie. He's such a foodie and, and, and a cool kid and a big, both of them are big footballers. And then Marcus has been three years now in the UK. 
And he's found it kind of tough in the UK. He's found it tough, you know, as a Filipino to sometimes being away from the family and being away from your culture. And um, he's on his way back on Thursday. I'll be picking him up. And after three years of him being out there and, and working and, and digressing in different parts, including bartendering and construction and a number of other things, is I'm very happy that he's coming home to rest and he deserves a break from the intensity of working in the UK. And then uh, we'll see when he wants to go back again. But uh, yeah, two. He has a British boys. accent. Oh he yes. British, nah. He had an American accent when he left here. <laughs> oh, you know. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, Dad. But, uh, no, yes, all right, Dad. <laughs> okay, Dad. <laughs> yeah. they're, 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 ama they're amazing boys. Love them to bits. Love them to. And of course, you know, Daddy there. Yeah. Okay. And that's Palawan in the background. That's gorgeous oh. Palawan. That's when Dad uh, came over to Palawan, so that's why I picked the photo. Awesome. Awesome. Oh, that's a great photo. That's the shipping lines. That's uh, Holland America. Uh, um, I've been funded uh, for the association and the support of the leasing family and Jacob Davino for many years now, and they've never questioned uh, a day of, of you know us putting up the original seed money to build the association. And it was launched at uh, one uh, Port Santiago and an inspiring uh, group. I mean, when you look at 14,000 uh, Filipinos running the seas, running the oceans, I mean, these guys here. Um, and then there's, I think, Kim Santos is there somewhere behind the bars. And Kim actually works at CCA and now is, I think he's the director of culinary for Caribbean or one other, either Hol not all America, it's the Caribbean, I think, food is. And uh, we're working together to look at how we could um, make a um, uh, shipping program together to be more relevant today to the ships, um, which would include plant-based and healthy food and, uh, you know, those... Um, and, and, and I'm pushing very hard to get Filipino cuisine on the ships because, you know, you know what happens on the ships, right? The yeah. Filipinos end up cooking Filipino, not on the menu. But why would you do that? There's such a demand for Filipino cuisine. And so cook Filipino cuisine, right? Take out a little bit more of the French and cook more uh, uh, Southeast Asian cuisine. So, yeah, we're, 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 on, we're, in the, we're, we're working very hard on this and get a night. It was dug down. So that's the group. That's the team, Dr. Luna and uh, Bea. Um, so we're working on all of that. So that's a that's a monumental meeting, uh, probably three months ago. Wow, nice. Uh, uh, so at least Filipino food won't be in a secret menu in the cruise. Uh, if you're <laughs> no, yeah, 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 with a QR scan and the chef. But it's funny how that always goes on. It's going to be there on menus. Let's get it there on menus, right? So again, yeah. <laughs> nice. All right. Uh, that's an Escoffier dinner at the Peninsula. Um, and, you know, it's hard as a French association for me to recruit French chefs to inspire Filipinos because they don't stay here very long. They're here for yeah. a year or two years. I mean, we're lucky to, to, to keep on to Cyril. Thank, congratulations to Cyril Sonin for getting the admiral yeah. job, right? And, you know, Cyril's been around as, as long as me as well. And he's been yeah. through so many. But what an inspiring and what a a great chef as well, um, sharing his talents in the Philippines. And this dinner was a great dinner. And there were two, three or four French guys that uh, are actually left the country and want to come back and, and open and do. But that was a great dinner. And I love the peninsula. It's, uh, it's such a, you've got some like the Mandarin. I mean, all those hotels, I mean, that's where I came from. You know, when I got into the hotel business, you always have the silverware, you have all the luxuries, and then when you open your own restaurant, <laughs> you're challenged, right? <laughs> Reality. <laughs> <laughs> okay. yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, that's fine. Oh, there you go. So, you know, again, SNL Fine Foods, Sinan Bator, you know, suppliers are key for us, and I was very lucky as a chef, um, to step my foot into um, SNL and to get into importation. And Ooh. I'm very involved in importation. And Reggie Spiris wrote up and said, you know, it's very unique to see a chef digress into, um, uh, you know, products, the food, the food chain. Yeah. And then as a chef, I was going to meet chefs and listening to the same concerns like, you know, we need this, we need that. There's no continuity in this. And then, of course, we brought in Stockyard, which is amazing beef, 
uh, John Dees from Queensland. So really bringing world-class products to the Philippines. And I continue to help and advise uh, a number of uh, groups in terms of bringing in uh, items that we need and that when our Filipino chefs that have, say, worked abroad come back to the country to open up, that they know that that is the kind of brand of the Parmesan or the Gruyere or whatever um, that they want on their menu. So I spend a fair bit of time, and especially it's so important for our students to understand uh, product identification. And uh, when they go and work abroad, is for the Zet, I handled this, I cooked with these lobsters, I did that. I'm all about local, absolutely. But as well, I'm also about global cooking. So we have to understand this jamon or this prosciutto, and what it is yeah. and why it is and how to handle okay. it, how to carve it and how to taste it. This, this, right, as you said, it's a never ending sleeping, you know, a process where sleep is very valuable when you can get it because it's a constant learning progress. You consistently learn and learn and learn if you push yourself. All right. Nice. Uh, yeah, there are also uh... two comments. You might forget to mention them later, Anton. Sorry. Ah, okay. All right. Yeah, yeah. Go. Gary Reyes. Okay. Yeah. So that's my dad's kitchen in England. He just moved to a new property by the coast. And that's Marcus, my oldest, who... So it's changed around now. The smallest is the highest now, right? So <laughs> the one in the green is taller than his brother now. And uh, legal management. And then this one is doing bartending and stuff like that. And he's on his way back. And, uh, you know... Um, that's a lovely shot. I mean, family is everything for me. And, uh, yeah. you know, the trials and tribulations. I mean, I admire the Philippines. Your families are so big, right? And you know, we have two or three kids here. You know, a whole barangay. Right? So, <laughs> <laughs> it's just amazing how, I mean, I was with, I was with uh, dear Nadia Montenegro for 50th. who's a very inspiring and an amazing story. And I was with her last night. Oh, this is the family. Wow. I mean, it's huge. I mean, <laughs> she has such a huge family as well. And I just, you know, just imagine discussions. So I'm kind of somewhat, although I, I seem extrovert, I am kind of to a certain degree private as well. I like to keep, Kind of as I get older, a little bit more time to myself, and it's just amazing how in the Philippines, no one has it's just every function, event, cooking. I mean, it's just amazing how the Philippines is always so busy. The fiesta every week, right? So it's just incredible. yes, okay. all right. Next, ah, there you go, amazing shot taken recently of CCA, Trisha Campo, Cohen Fontanillo. Um, uh, right here in the front is our dear Jasper Visosa, who's an amazing guy. He's our program manager. He's promoted during COVID, and I moved up as culinary director. I was the program director, and now he's handling the day-to-day -day programs and doing a brilliant job with the team. And now I'm looking at exactly what you said, job placement, internship, how I can work with the industry and the world to bring our Filipino chefs to the forefront of culinary globally. So Everybody's still wearing masks? <laughs> you know, uh, I believe I believe that's still the protocol of testing. I oh, okay. don't want to put myself on the line. No, I, I think, um, yeah, that uh, it's still unlike America and London, no one's wearing masks at all, Nancy, you know? Yeah. Everyone's back to normal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, people are just being careful. But that's a shot at uh, Spider Hook, uh, which is the um, campus. So, mm -hmm. yeah, so um, they're doing a great job, and congratulations to the team at CCA. I love you all, and you're doing a fabulous job in terms of uh, the next generation of, of chefs and cooks to come. Okay. All right. All right. Next. Yeah, that's the team again. That's the core team. There's Dr. Luna there, such an inspiration. Uh, we're working on amazing programs, including, believe it or not, uh, temple cuisine, Buddhism uh, cuisine. And they were a Catholic, uh, um, mm -hmm. a Catholic society, very strong, but again, cuisines and religions are very interesting. So I spent some time in Vietnam. I just adore Vietnam as a country as well. I find it very unique. But this, um, we're now looking at how we can incorporate uh, temple cuisine and cooking with lotus leaves. So we're trying to continue to be ahead and be very relevant in terms of trends that we see or us to be the trend sector. So... Um, we don't worry about competition out there. There's always going to be competition. We're very focused on what we need to do and give the CCA. Okay. And last photo. Wow. Yes, Scott. There you go. 
So the Escoffier, yeah, the red sash is a master chef. The green sash is for supplier. Um, the purple sash is for wine. And the blue sash is the most favorable sash is gourmand. So we only exist for our clients. We only exist to cook and serve for, you know, our patrons. So that's a great group of individuals out there. And, you know, I don't have time to, to go through any of them, but there's Thailand there, there's China, there's Cambodia. And they're one phone, phone call away for me to be able to put a chef to go over and do something uh, there and come back. And we would love to see now that COVID, we've got rid of COVID, for us to see more multicultural exchanges um, and chefs coming in and out and sharing their knowledge so that we become you know, a bigger cookbook. And we're all working on a uh, ebook at the moment, which is brilliant. We're 13 delegations. We have 10 chefs from the Philippines. I'm sure you know most of those chefs. And we're producing one Filipino recipe and one French recipe. So uh, my one, let's say lentils, right? So a mongo soup here, mongo. and then a lentil de poire soup uh, yeah. France. So dish by dish. So Filipino cuisine is going to be put uh, uh, on a right. very, very interesting cookbook. So yeah. yeah. Who's the lady in the photo? I can't see her. Yeah, there's a lady. She's the only lady. Oh, she's probably the second. Uh, yeah, she's a she's a chef. Well, actually, we have yeah. a lot of female chefs in there. She's obviously from. I think she's from the Chinese del. No, she's from Hong Kong. From the Hong Kong delegation, and it's amazing. But uh, we do have a lot of ladies in, um, lady chefs in Escoffier. So it's not male dominated. And we have more and more uh, ladies coming up, female chefs coming up, very good female talented chefs coming up in our association. Okay. Nice. Wow, very uh, interesting story. So last few questions from me. Um, obviously, you're very motivated throughout these years. Not, uh, you know, you have a lot of ideas. What keeps you motivated? And uh, any advice for chefs out there keep them relevant to the scene until now okay health keep healthy it's been a very very stressful time I, as we all know so mentally you know why you smile and have so much energy and you're pushing and pushing and yeah. pushing you know in the back of your mind you know you're always looking at failure and i've been through lots of failures yeah and why we always remain upbeat push forward is that this is a very tough job, right? And you need good friends around you, dear friends. Yeah. You need, um, you, need you need friends. Space. You need friends, and you need good friends, and you need good advice, solid advice. But you need to be healthy. And we lost a lot of good people during COVID. And you know, I lost a very good dear friend the other day. You know as well. Um, and the ABA, ABC uh, anchor. I was oh, yeah, very very yeah. surprised. Yeah, and you know, growing up in in, in in the restaurant business, you there are lots of vices, right? There's alcohol, there's all sorts of stuff going on. So as a chef, you the, 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 you know it's you you you're consistently working and grinding and and pushing yourself. And I think you know if it wasn't for the Philippines, right? It, I look at my friends back in England, and I look at them with the same age. <laughs> they look rough. <laughs> <laughs> they look tired. I mean, they look, you know, the Fili what, what's good about the Philippines is it, 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 there's so much love, there's so much happiness, and you know, even yes. if you're down to your last kind of few bucks, it's a resilient country. It's so resilient. But you know, the world is a tough place. It's a tough place, and um, and it's tough for our chefs to get out there. So keep your health, keep your state of mind, keep positive. Get out there and get those walks. Walk every morning as you can. I walk at six thirty every morning. So get out there and walk and be healthy and breathe fresh air and as much time you get and spend time with family when you can because it's a very unforgiving trade, right? We're really committed to the stove and to our patrons and it's a 365 business, right? So make time for family, make time to take care of yourself uh, in this industry, right? And have okay. great people around you. Don't be many have really good people there to help you when you go through the darkness that looms you know around and right. um, there are times when there's some dark times there right so yeah keep pushing yeah awesome advice um now next qu question uh what happened to the students uh entering into culinary school were there were they discouraged because of the 
two years pandemic, you know, when the restaurant hospitality was down. And, you know, they're also in a disadvantage because they were all like online for two years. Um, are still more people going to culinary hospitality after the pandemic? Um, any advice for them getting into this industry? Okay. Again, again, yes, yes, that's a great question. But again, because our curriculum is so well thought out and planned and developed and tried and tested, we do put a lot of emphasis on Filipino cuisine, on Korean, Asian cuisine. I won't go <laughs> and highlight too much, but there are a lot of schools that stick to a certain, let's say, French-based curriculum, right? Which is great, and it's good to know your fundamentals and techniques, and I'm, I'm such a scoffier sworn by guy for that but learning how to use a walk right learning how to use a walk i design kitchens today where hold on where's the walk right i mean <laughs> fundamentally it's, you know ask uncle roger um but um you know walk cuisine is is is, is such a big demand for ships such a big demand so getting students uh we were very lucky we have been very very lucky we've actually done you know very well in recruiting and that's the whole team did a brilliant job um but in terms of the digital platform we were able to do it we were able, it wasn't uh how do i say it, you know it had its challenges because of internet connection and because of this and that and whatever and people not having say ipads or this and that but in a way i actually think we have a stronger batch in the last two years than ever before i really believe that i believe that those students were given challenges that would never have been there in our lifetime if COVID hadn't come along. And those students did an incredible job, even down to the Marikina issue where we stopped all classes and we then put a food program together to go and feed um, the floods of Marikina, right? So it's just amazing and when, when I think back at how those students, you know, our, our current batches, our students got through the last few years and kudos to them because under you know um exceptional stats that circumstances to get where they got and they really divert de de um, deserve their diploma and they deserve and i expect great things from these students over the last few years and i hope to work with them and um, see them progress in the industry but congratulations to them getting through the last few years it was definitely yeah, not nice. easy but we did it we did it we did it nice um, and then coming out of the lockdowns, you know, in a, looking into the post-pandemic world, uh, what do you see trends happening um, in Manila uh, particularly? Because you've seen it come and go already. <laughs> uh, what do you see, you know, if uh, there are people watching this up to this end uh, and they're, you know, planning their own restaurant, planning, you know, a hospitality, any advice on the trends that you're seeing that, they can probably capitalize on or maybe the new students that uh you know just graduated uh what are the trends uh that you're seeing okay i see long-term trends here and sustainable trends first is plant-based obviously the amount of plant-based products coming out here and in the beginning they weren't so great now it's amazing how jackfruit becomes pulled pork and all of a sudden chili so so it's amazing because i'm trying to if you're a vegetarian and you don't like meat, why would you buy something that is a chicken nugget or a beef burger? So, and it's vegetable protein based. The yeah. proteins are changing. So I'm actually here with a group from London. I have dinner with them on Friday. They're coming to an Escoffier dinner. And he's looking to put a sauce factory here. And he's producing sauces in the UK. He started with cooking wine. It's a 16,000 square meter factory. And I see more and more uh, transparency coming into food items. So supermarkets, as you saw, Landers, as you saw, uh, One World Deli, you saw a number of these delicatessens. SNL continues to grow its Barrera brand. You're going to see more delicatessens, delicatessens with great baked items, great desserts, great bread. And what happened in pandemic? Everyone looked at their kitchen and said, "Okay, I've got to bake some bread." You know, I went to the supermarkets, there's no bread on the shelves, right? So mm -hmm. the supermarkets were challenged in the beginning because everyone was staying at home and buying online. So the trend of buying online, I'm heavily involved with digital kitchens. We have a uh, company called Color Kitchen, Republicist, which is bank banked on an e-wallet. 
under union banks. I'm heavily involved with taking restaurants like Caruso. There's 20 years, has great DNA. But why would you send a steak Florentine to be takeout on your menu? You do a menu that's designed to be able to be transported and packaged in um, uh, uh, packaging that is really traceable, sustainable, and ethical, right? So therefore, I see so many amazing trends that we wouldn't, and they're here to stay, right? They're not going to be in and out. They're going to be long-term. And that involves health. It involves the way that we plate food, put food together. We take out the too many of the processes. It's clean and it's nice. And, it, and, and it's going to be a very, very interesting time for people coming into our industry and for the youth. And I think it's one, one of the most exciting times. But there has to be a lot of thought going behind the process. Um, and I'd like to see things like, as I'm very involved with the curry and curries and spices, I'd like to see us produce our own pastes here that are world class. I saw it in Singapore. I saw it in other countries being exported to other countries. I would love to see the continuation of bottling fermentation pastes coming out of the Philippines. Oh and if goodness. I was in another country, I'd be able to take that mushroom powder or wherever it is that is homegrown from the Philippines, be able to do a dinner in Raffles, Singapore or somewhere that, um, or Fullerton and show Philippine DNA, Philippine produced items, or they be pickled, fermented or curried or whatever. So that's where I'm at now is to continue to um, work with our students to think outside of the box. You may not end up in a restaurant, you may end up in you know, so many different avenues to go into food service. Um, yeah. May I suggest since you're into plant-based also, right now I've been reading a lot about banana peel. Banana peel yes. that can be powdered, yes. can be a fertilizer, yes. it can also be for a tea for human beings, you know. Um, and I know Annie, Annie, whom we will also guess one of these Amazing. Days, she's into zero waste. So, you know. She's um, incredible. Yeah, I know. So, uh, making, drying banana leaf, banana peel and making them into powder is really a big potential, the way I see it. Anyway. It is. And it super, no, no, you're right. You're right. And my man, he was the green chefmanship. She was the first to put that on the map, and she was the inspiration behind CCA, uh, recognized by ACF. American. By the way, all our uh, faculty passed their ACF exams last week. Uh, congratulations to them. So again, you know, online learning and doing their exam. But like you said, the peel, the vegetables, everything, zero waste kitchens. The first zero waste kitchen, I'm proud to say, came from the UK. So again, how do we get them to share their knowledge in the Philippines. That's what I'm doing. I'm trying to build bridges throughout the world in, in the, the limited time that I have to get, you know, on this planet to get all those links so that I leave a legacy, right? You know, I would as like, like to spend a bit more time on the Philippine coasts with a restaurant and a school. That's yeah. my aim. When I came here, I wanted to be by the sea, but I ended up in Metro Manila. <laughs> Like <laughs> the concrete jungle, so it wasn't the illusion of me coming to the Philippines and being on in a tropical island and whatever. Well, it was hard graft, right? In a concrete jungle, that now we're starting to get thank you roads to Pampanga, roads to here, roads to that, yeah. which opens up so much yeah. opportunity for this country, right? Ah. Pampanga, which is my dear province, right? Yeah, yeah, and so, maybe my last question because I, I know you wanted to be. In the coast, and uh, you've uh, worked with a uh, exclusive Palapa, uh, Palawan yeah, Island. Ariara. I'm not sure if you can uh, talk about that, or yeah. are they? We open can, we or? can, absolutely. Yeah. So Ar Ariara is a unique place run by an English guy. It's actually run by a, his German diver that became the GM. Ariara is an amazing place. It's an amazing gem in the Philippines. So for me, as a chef, the greatest test is to, if you look at my car, you'll see that. My kitchen is in my car. So then I arrive at the airport, put stuff on a plane, or and then I arrive on a boat, and I go four hours out in the middle of the Philippine Sea. And I have guests from all over the world. We had Tony Blair. I cooked from some amazing people uh, out there in the middle of the sea with, with a crew that's never been to Manila, you know, with carpenteros, with fishermen's sons, right, <laughs> in our kitchen, right? And I'm out there in a James Bond movie, in the middle of the ocean, cooking 
from what I can find, what I can fish, what I can get. Yes, I do have my lamb rack and stuff that comes in, but I prioritize foreigners coming into this country to understand Philippine food, Philippine food culture. Why would you fly all the way for a lamb rack that you can get in London or Hong Kong or China? We need to look at producing and uh, showcasing more of great, Philippine produce and supporting those farmers, those, those fishermen. Um, and that's what I'm doing. I'm not just saying it. I'm part of what's happening at the moment. We're, you know, we're only in an hour into the show, but if I had half a day to do a lecture in the seminar and it's share amazing, more, yeah. we've only scratched <laughs> in the surface. We're only scratching the surface, right? Yeah. But Ariara is a super amazing place. About $700 a night to go there. It's like Balinese style, um, villas and you know you have 30 36 staff for 10 people wow. so what do you think will happen there? it's an incredible place. i'm very very proud to be part and to continue to send chefs there so if i want to test the chef to see if he really is worth his stock buddy you're going to ariara tell me how it is <laughs> of course you get the support he's out there you're gonna see i mean working on an island is very different to working uh, land base and that's again is chefs are, as you know so many different temperaments and, and different um uh, opinions but go out there for hours out the sea and uh cook uh, from morning to night it tests me that's a long day for me that's uh, almost 18 hours of production and cooking and making stocks and i really do go beyond but uh, i have a formula that i'm always willing to share with any chefs Chair. Be successful. <laughs> Chair, come with me to Ariara and I'll share with you. We'll do a promotion uh, there. We'll do, Give me $700. We'll do <laughs> I'll, I'll take, I'll, don't worry. I'll, you're <laughs> <laughs> Nancy, uh, okay. I have, uh, I've asked all my questions. Very inspiring uh, conversation. I have one. Yeah. Yeah. What yes. do you do when you're not doing anything? I'm always not doing, <laughs> I'm always doing something. What am I doing? <laughs> You know, I have a passion for tennis, but I can't get to the tennis court because it's just <laughs> been difficult down lockdown. So I like to jump on my bike now. You know, I've got a couple of bikes and, and we're not, not not motorcycles, but but push bikes and as much as I can, you know, I like to, to, to bike if I can. And I love to hit the water if I can find any excuse to cook um, near the water or near the sea. That really is um, therapy for me. Okay. That's we good. all need good therapy. Yes, we do. <laughs> yes, we do. Yeah. But thank you so much for thank you know you. for for let me share a little bit about Philip. You know, um, uh, there's a lot more to share, and I really hope that in the next coming years that I'll be invited back and continue to open and hopefully with the student or hopefully, uh, yeah. you know, we can share the story of of, of my students, which yeah. are. Are doing and now are, are accomplished chefs all over the world. So, uh, you know, we're, do, we're doing the best we can to do our job to produce the talent. And, you know, I'm nothing without my team. I'm nothing without, um, uh, in, obviously, to show relevance of being in the Philippines for so long. I have to show, and it really is our chefs and our front of house and our servers. So, you know, exciting times for the Philippines. And I'm so glad that we've got this uh, last three years behind us because it has yes. been a super challenge. So thank you. <laughs> Maraming salamat. And thank you for these two guys who, who gave them. Ne, wala lang si Gary lang. Uh, lang okay. All right. All right. Yeah, right. So, All can right. we stay like that? Guapo. Okay. I'll try. <laughs> I'll try. Maraming Sorry. salamat. <laughs> okay. Live an awesome thank life, so guys. Uh, God bless. Bye-bye. Uh, Take can care. Can you do a short video? Short video.